to welcome our MLA, Mike Bernier, and he's going to uh, do a bit of a Q&A as well as yeah. talk about some proportional representation. It seems to be an issue that's been uh, talked about quite a bit. So yes, welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you. Well, most of you all familiar faces in here, so uh, good to see everyone, and, and thanks for coming out. I know it's... Uh, if I told you it was going to be raining, maybe we would have had a few more people, but uh, it is summertime, and, and so thanks for, for coming out. It's, uh, it's nice to be here and do a couple of uh, little updates. I've, been, I've met uh, quite recently, actually, with Mayor and Council, so it's good to see uh, most of you here as well. I, I was saying when I came in, we have quorum, so we could almost uh, <laughs> make some motions today on anything you want. That's why we don't all sit together. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the Chetland Council. It's a big, happy family. It's okay if you sit together. Um, but anyway, thanks, thanks for coming out. And I think as I go through not only this, but other things, if you have any questions, I think uh, being a nice, small crowd that we are, let's ask them as we go along. Let's have a conversation. It's a lot easier than me just talking for a half hour and then you maybe forgetting what question you had. And, uh, and I like things, you know me, I like to be a little bit more interactive. Um, anyway, so. It's, it's been exciting uh, the last year, first of all, for the South Peace. There's been a lot uh, going on, but uh, for myself, of course, being in opposition now and being the critic for, for oil and gas development uh, makes things somewhat interesting in, in the province when you look at all of the development in our area, when you look at the opportunities around LNG and what that means uh, in the area here, uh, the Kinder Morgan pipeline down south, and of course, I'm uh, part of the debates on that, so never a dull moment uh, in my critic role. As the MLA for the South Peace, there's been a lot of, I'd say, uh, good work that's been happening lately too. So it's great to see, it took a couple of years on the highways, the work that's happening between here and Prince George, all of the bridge replacements. Uh, I'll be driving to Prince George tonight when I finish this, so I'll, I'll get to see what progress has been made, but when I came through a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was lots of work going on, so if you haven't had a chance to get through there, you're going to see that, you know, a lot of these um, multi-plates and culverts being replaced now with bridges, you know, things that are hopefully going to help uh, in the future uh, carry the water to where it should go so we don't have as many washouts on the highway shutting down the region, or even worse, uh, some of the problematic flooding and devastation that affected some of the families in the area. In, uh, in Dawson Creek, the Minister of uh, Health came up a couple of, uh, I guess a month ago, and announced the work that we were working on prior to. It's always interesting to change your government. They can make the announcements now and take credit for doing it, but I'm glad they're making the announcements anyway. The Dawson Creek Hospital is getting replaced, which is uh, something I stress here because I know that so many people in this area um, for different procedures obviously rely on the Dawson Creek Hospital. That's going to take a couple of years. It's not something that happens overnight, uh, but it's at least something that's been about 10 years in the works, and great to see that it's finally taking place. There's, yeah. It's getting replaced? Yes. Are we done? No. It's so, the way it's going to be, it is replaced, oh, okay. but it's not as, I, I, I maybe I'll make it sound a lot more simpler than it actually is. They have to rebuild it on the existing footprint. So it's going to be a three-phased build. It will probably take, I'm going to say, anywhere between six, eight, maybe even 10 years, if I was uh, guessing on it. Because uh, right now, they're going to be doing a, a new addition on the north end of the hospital, which will be uh, new inpatients, new emergency, and redoing part of the lab. Then they'll be going into the center part, tearing it down, and then adding on. And then the old, original hospital from the 60s, the old brick part, uh, then that will be the last part, and then they'll be building new administration and uh, new maternity wards and a few things like that. But it is going to have to be because we don't have a uh, greenfield opportunity like they did in Fort St. John to build new while uh, having the old. Um, they wanted to use the existing location in Dawson Creek. That was the choice that was made. And at the end, it's probably going to be, I, I, won't, I won't argue a uh, cost-effective choice because in the announcement, they say it will be anywhere between 320 to 350 million dollars. So uh, it's amazing what you can do with money. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, the rest of this, the uh, the riding things I think are going along uh, really smoothly. I have a great relationship with all the uh, mayors, councils, and the community, and so we stay in touch uh, quite regularly. 
uh, whenever there's issues. I know we have UBCM coming up, your worship. I assume you're going down, or maybe a few people going down. Uh, so I'll assist uh, any way possible down there as well. It is, um, before I get into this, it is interesting, different now being in opposition, to go from being the Minister of Education, being in Cabinet, and being part of basically every decision that was being made in government at the Cabinet table. Um, now, being on the outside, it gives me a whole new appreciation, uh, even for what the NDP went through uh, for their 16 years. When you're on the outside trying to make effective change and have your voice being heard, it's not easy. It's, uh, it's definitely not easy. And so it's one of the things that I've learned is you need to, you need to pick a couple of top issues because there's hundreds of issues in every riding. And if you try to blanket those all the time, it's white noise. So you have to start picking a few one or two priorities and working on them and trying to make change within the government and get your voice heard there and then move on to the next one. Uh, a lot different uh, than being in government, but I think it's also a good opportunity. One of the things that I talked about, uh, you know, I've said to people when we, the BC Liberals lost the last election, well, they're actually going to lose, but that's a whole different story. Um, when we didn't get, get into a majority government, I think it was an opportunity to reflect because after 16 years in government, you start taking things for granted. And you have to sit back and realize that you know things, some things are working really well, and there's things that maybe aren't that you weren't cognizant of that you have to really focus on. And so that sober second thought, uh, I think, is also important. I hope the rest of my colleagues uh, feel the same way because I think that's how you, you adapt and that's how you uh, grow as a party and help the government. So the big thing I want to talk about is around the proportional representation, the referendum that is going to be taking place this fall. Uh, the reason why I wanted to focus on this, I'm, I'm getting, I'll, I'll bet you it's the number one conversation right now in coffee shops, um, and it's the number one in my office, anywhere I go, people are saying, what does it mean? Why is it happening? You know, what are the outcomes? What could change? And so it's gonna be, I think, really important that people understand. So I'm glad you're here for this, and what I really hope at the end of this is you get out and have conversations with people as well. Because right now it's the summer season. I don't know too many people, unless you're really politically minded, that are sitting around um, the barbecue scene right now, having their burger, saying, so how are you gonna vote proportional representation referendum? It's not really front and center, but we need to get it there because this has mechanisms are in place to completely change what we have here in British Columbia. So I'm gonna go through, uh, it's just a bit of a quick slide deck, but uh, bear with me because I kind of wrote some notes this morning on this because I wanna make sure uh, on this that, that we really get the full picture of, of what's going on uh, right now <coughs> and what can change. So we all know what's happening on the right hand side right now. When you have an election, we have first past the post system in BC. Local governments, um, if you're running for mayor, it's uh, it's the same thing. Whoever gets the most votes wins. Some people will argue, and the people that are proportional representation advocates will say, but that's not fair because not everybody's voice is being heard. Because if you look at that, so candidates for the BC Liberal Party might get the most votes, but some people voted for John, Susan, and David. So they'll, people are out there saying, well, that's not fair. The people have voted for the other three. Nobody's their voice now. I take personal offense to that. And the reason why, and I stood up in the legislature this year, this spring, and challenged the Green Party when they put this forward, because they said, if anybody in Mike's writing, because I was the voice, or the vocal one in the legislature, so they picked on me on this, they said, if anybody in Mike's riding voted Green or NDP, they're not being represented. And so I stood up and said, you know, I don't know one time that somebody's come into my constituency office where I've said, who did you vote for before I decide whether I'm going to help you? Once an election happens, and it's the same for other elected officials here, once the election happens, you're representing your region or your community. You're not representing the people who voted for you. You go through an electoral process to choose who that representative is going to be to represent you. And that's what we have right now. So you're gonna see as we go through this, I'm gonna be a little jaded on why I am 
drastically or very emotionally against proportional representation. Um, and if you have any questions to the slide deck, let me know. Because there are a lot of people that are in favor for different reasons, and, and their voice on this is important as well. Um, but you're going to see why I'm personally uh, hoping that it does not pass. When you look at when we have the system we have right now, parties are important. And the reason why parties are important is if you're fortunate enough to have a first-past-the-post system and you get a majority government elected, you can make effective change in government. That does not mean everybody in the party is 100% like-minded. You look at the BC Liberal Party, and I would argue the NDP as well, they're a coalition. So we have everybody in the BC Liberals that are everything from hard right social conservatives to center federal liberals, and we're all in one tent. And we all work together. And so there's give and take, and we work together to try to make the best decisions possible. A lot of people will say, why do we even have to have parties? Why don't we just have all independent MLAs? On paper or on a conversation, that sounds great. The problem is nothing would happen. Because in order to make change, it's no different than a council, you have to have a majority vote to pass. So in BC, we have 87 MLAs. If you had 87 independent people, the only time anything would change is if a majority of those 87 people were like-minded on an issue and got together and voted together. And what have you just created? A party. That's how party situations have been formed. And this goes back hundreds of years. And the first past the post system in the um, British parliamentary system goes back hundreds of years. Some people will say it's outdated, but is it perfect? No. Um, but as Winston Churchill said, democracy isn't perfect, uh, the electoral system isn't perfect, but it's better than anything else we've ever tried. And that's kind of where we're at with first past uh, the post. The, um, the other thing I should really mention here is the NDP put forward this referendum this fall. One of the things that um, a lot of people who are cognizant pay attention is that was put forward as a negotiation between the Green Party and the NDP. The Green Party wanted proportional representation. They said that they would put the NDP in power and take out the BC Liberals if they agreed to do this referendum. So that's where we're at. And one of the issues I have is it's all been done behind closed doors. The referendum information came out the last day of session. We were asking for the NDP, okay, if you're going to do this, put it out. Let's, let's at least talk about it and debate. And they put it out the last day of session before uh, we even had a chance to, to really talk about it. So it really uh, made things you know, difficult to really have a, a good conversation. So if you go to to proportional representation, like I said, I'm going to explain a little bit of this as we go. Please ask questions if you have some. But it can really lead to some some radical changes, and this is where it's important to have that conversation with people. Right now, you elect your local MLA off of a list of whoever runs, whoever gets the most votes wins. I represent you and I represent this region and I'm from this region. Under proportional representation, your MLAs are not chosen anymore by you, they're chosen off a party list. So what would happen is the BC Liberals will decide who they want to be on the list in the province as their candidates. They don't have to live in your riding, they don't have to be from your area, they don't have to know the issues. And so that's one of the things that I have um, a real problem with because you're going to end up having, um, and I'll explain it in a few minutes how it's happened in other parts of the world that have PR, but all the negotiations happening behind closed doors and then what you get in your riding, you lose that accountability. And I am very adamant about the fact that if you're a councillor, a mayor, an MLA, if you're not doing a good enough job, the people should have the right to vote you out next election by voting somebody else in. And that's what we have in our present system. Under PR, it doesn't work that way because the people are appointed uh, whether they do a good job or not. Uh, whether you wanted that person or not, they're appointed off lists. So it really changes the whole 
dynamic now of the importance of being loyal to a party rather than in the constituency. So right now, for instance, the PC Liberal Party that I'm part of, um, we have a free vote system. And in the last uh, session, you would have seen, if there was something at the floor that I didn't agree with, I could vote against it. I wasn't loyal to the party, I was loyal to the constituents. The majority of the time I vote in favor, which is why I'm aligned with that party. But there was some times I wasn't, and I voted against. Under PR, it's a completely different dynamic, because you're now appointed and part of really the party in the back room. You're not actually anymore representing the constituency completely. You're going to hear uh, different sides of that that are advocates for PR, that it'll be more fair, because you'll be represented by people fair on the vote but that doesn't necessarily transcend into the person you want, if that makes sense. So I have a question. Yeah. So the list that you were talking about that they're picked from, mm -hmm. so if the NDP and the Green are in power right now, if this goes through, yes. the MLAs that they will assign, I'm assuming are going to be NDP and Green Party. The MLAs that are going to be assigned to the locations? So I'll explain it a little bit okay. as we go through, but really what it's, uh, if I don't, uh, Please remind me. But really, what it means is when you have a lists, they're, they're going to have ridings around the province. The party will decide who the candidates are going to be in that ride in those ridings. The ridings are going to change as well. And so, when the whole acronym of PR, proportional representation, is the MLAs that will be sitting in the legislature are proportional to the provincial wide vote of of the election. So just to, I guess, try to simplify it, right now there's three green MLAs in Victoria. They were all elected in southern Vancouver Island. On paper, they got 17, I think it was, percent of the overall provincial vote. So the argument is, under proportional representation, they should have 17 percent of the seats in the legislature, not three they should have 14. Under PR, you can see why they want PR. Under PR, if the last election was under PR, the Greens would have 14 MLAs right now in Victoria. So where the party lists come from is you look at the North, for instance, and, and I'm only going out by what we can assume because they haven't put all the information out there even though we've asked for it. We've been asked to vote on a, a referendum without all the information. but. There could theoretically be, okay, um, we're going to have 14 MLAs, and so here's our list, and here's the 14 we're going to choose, and these are the writings they're going to represent, and the seats that they would be part of. And that all happens based on the popular vote. So it, it's no longer Peace River South, Peace River North, whoever gets the most votes wins that. Uh, and I'll show you a map in a second of what was proposed. Um, it completely changes that dynamic. So there is proportional representation used in other parts of the world. But if we get PR in British Columbia, we will be only the second English-speaking um, jurisdiction in the world that is using this form of election. Everywhere else uses a first-past-the-post system or an electoral college system like the United States or something like that. Um, there, there's a lot of places that use PR in Africa and places that you know, we try not to emulate. But if you look at, you know, the list that we have up here, the reason why I put this one up here, when you look at other countries that had proportional representation, since World War II, they've had an election almost every year in, uh, in some of these countries. You know, Italy, Greece, Belgium, they constantly are going to over turnover compared to Canada, who's only had 22. The reason being is, even in BC, we do a fixed term election where we have elections over three, four years. You elect who you want. If they don't work, then the government comes in four years. You have that choice. Under PR, it doesn't work that way. Under PR, you have the election. All of the MLAs are chosen based on the popular vote. And then out of that, they have to form coalition groups to try to create a majority. Because back to what I said earlier, you never can pass anything in the House unless you have a majority. And so it's very unstable um, government because you can do your negotiations to have uh, a majority, and then all of a sudden, you know, 
three people in one party say, I no longer like you, and so I drop out, now they don't have a majority, boom, you're in an election. So that's what happens all the time. It's a little bit similar to what we're almost seeing right now in British Columbia, except the way our system is set up right now is so close it might not happen. But the Greens could at any time say, we no longer support the NDP, we're going to support the BC Liberals, we're back to an election. Right? It can happen any time. Right, I don't see it happening anytime soon uh, because they're aligned and working on things together. Um, but that could happen, and that's what happens when you get all these different uh, fringe parties that happen. And so, you know, I'm saying it really creates um, an unstable government. So from a business perspective, if you're a forestry company, a mining company, and you're thinking, okay, there could be an election every year, every two years, you don't know what the government's policies are because they could change overnight depending on what they want to do to stay in power. You know, those are things that we have to legitimately think about. And obviously I'm going to sound jaded on, on, on this and, and people who are in favor of proportional representation will maybe say something uh, quite a bit different to what I am. But I'm just sharing my experience of what I see inside and what could happen that can really affect us. And the bottom one is one that's, that scares me, is it's what happens when you have extreme groups and all. I'll show you something in a minute that we see uh, around the province. Now, a bit to your point about lists and, and ridings. So this is a map that shows what could happen under proportional representation. PR now goes to no longer every riding has a voice and under the BC election system right now where they try to modify and have the 87 ridings. You still could have 87 MLAs but what that would mean is they would change the majority of them would be down south in the lower mainland, Vancouver Island, places like that. The last, this is, this is actually what scares me. Look at this map. So you'd have Dawson Creek, Chetwin, and basically the whole north has one riding. I'll show you the referent, on the referendum questions afterwards, but the reason why this is important is that doesn't necessarily mean, it could be one MLA running that, or it could mean there's three or four MLAs up there running that. But we haven't been told. The uh, government and the Green Party has said, if PR passes, we'll explain all that afterwards. So all we can go on is what we know right now, which you can see makes me nervous. Um, I always laugh at this one. I borrowed this slide when it says, riding's the size of European countries. My riding's already the size of Belgium. <laughs> so we have um, about 40,000 people here. Belgium has about 14 million people, and we're about yeah, same size. But when I talk about extreme groups and what can happen, this, when you look at other jurisdictions that are using PR, um, you look at Germany, for instance. 92 of the people that were appointed after the last election were from the neo-Nazi party. And this is the one that I find really, is almost like a case study, interesting. So this gentleman here ran for an extreme anti-immigration party in New Zealand. They got wiped off the map, less than 8% in the election. Nobody won a seat. He's the leader of the party. He lost his own seat in his own riding. But under PR, because they got 8% of the vote, they were allowed 8% of the vote seats in the legislature, even though nobody won. So, of course, who did he appoint? He appointed himself. He ended up becoming the MLA MP in New Zealand. He ended up having a swing vote um, while he was there. So he negotiated himself with the party that says, I will support you to get into government if you make me the deputy premier of the country. So here you have a guy who nobody won a seat from his party. He lost in his own riding and he's now the deputy premier. You know, that, to me, when you're looking at what can happen in PR, that to me is completely wrong. Um, to say that you know, the people in favor of PR are saying, well, yeah, but those 8% those people have voted for them and their voice is now being heard. You know, so I guess it depends on how you want to, uh, to take that there. So when we talk about it, look at British Columbia. We have 27 registered parties right now in BC. This, this is presently active. Is it for me or? <laughs> Could be. Yeah. Well, it's not the cowboy. <laughs> but we do have, uh, right now, 27 parties. Under PR, that's expected to grow 
uh, not shrink. Now, of course, um, you know, we have three, four parties uh, that really get most of the attention. Of course, the three elected parties. Uh, the BC Conservative Party still gets a fair bit of attention. They don't have any MLAs, but they still garner media, and they usually get, um, you know, 8% of the provincial vote. So I've talked with some people who are BC Conservatives. They're humming and hawing on where they want to be on PR. Um, PR means you'll probably continue to have NDP Green Alliance government, but under a PR um, system, you would end up having two BC Conservatives maybe appointed in, in the legislature. So it's hard to see what they'll, what they'll look at, what they want. But when you look at some of these things, these parties all run, and kind of like the Green Party would happen. You know, they only ran in half the problem, half the uh, ridings around the problems. And they still got, they got 18%. The majority of the vote, those votes were Vancouver, North Shore, and Vancouver Island. And back to my earlier comment, they would have 14 MLAs, which what that means is the BC Liberals, NDP, and everybody else, everybody goes down. And so you'll end up having all these people, who, all these parties that run, you'll probably see if they get, I think they lowered the threshold. Uh, you only need to have two people now to have official party status. The NDP changed that for the Green Party. It used to be four. It's now only two. And I believe, and I could be wrong, I forgot to uh, look up this one before I came, it's only 5% of the vote you need to have a seat now in the House. So every single one of these parties can run, as long as they get three, four, five percent in a few ridings, they'll now be eligible to have a seat in the legislature. So the, that garnered the question of, okay, if we have 87 MLAs right now, if you go into the system, what does that mean? Other places, like Italy, they had to double the amount of MLAs to meet the quota because there were so many parties running that met that threshold. Well, now you have to have a seat in the House. It's no longer capped at the 87. So some countries, like in Italy, for instance, uh, started at 90, and they've got about almost 200, I believe, now, MLAs. And so now they all have to work together to try to find a majority. So back to my point, you can see how unstable um, that can get. The big problem that I'm finding right now is getting information. The, the Green Party and the NDP uh, work together they actually created the rules for this referendum. They didn't go to the public. John Horgan originally promised that there would be a yes or no referendum. And that's changed. It's gone to a uh, ranking kind of ballot now is what they're going to do. And this is where I have a lot of problem because the public hasn't been able to scrutinize what the referendum is going to be, going to be about, or what the outcomes of that could even look like because every answer that been given so far is we'll wait to see the outcome of the referendum before we decide what will happen. The big thing that I highlight here is the thresholds. The, so we've had two referendums in the past in British Columbia. The thresholds for those were 60% plus one to pass um, to go to proportional representation and it also had regional thresholds. So the ridings, the 87 ridings at the time, it was 85 ridings, had to also have 60% of the ridings had to be in favor. That was put in to avoid um, one or two major centers outvoting the rest of the province. Under this referendum, they've gotten rid of all that. It's now every vote is a vote, doesn't matter where you're from, and they lowered the threshold to 50% plus one. So technically, you could have all of Vancouver vote, and it doesn't matter what the rest of the province does. You could have every single other jurisdiction, city, riding <coughs> against it would still pass. Might sound extreme, might sound, people can say I'm fear-mongering, but I'm just saying that's a reality, that could happen. And it won't happen, I know, but it could. And that's not a fair process. Because we could have, to use this riding as an example, we could have 100% of the people here against PR, it doesn't matter if everybody in Vancouver votes in favor. And I have a problem with that because under the other two um, referendums, we put together what was called a citizens' assembly. So instead of the politicians deciding what the referendum would look like and the politicians having the rules, 
there were people that were nominated and people who were uh, put their names forward to sit on this large committee and they put the recommendations forward to government and it was a binding to use in the referendum. So that was truly a representative of what those other two referendums were. This time, it's different. Okay. The, uh, what I'm hoping, I've asked um, Premier Horgan and David e Minister Eby, because we said, what if only 5 or 10% of the population take the time to vote? Because nobody's talking about this right now. So what if only 10% of the people in BC even vote? and it passes by 50 plus 1. That means you've got 5% of the population has now changed the electoral system in the province. Prince Edward Island went through a referendum, and they did the same thing as BC. And they showed, I would argue, good leadership. Because at the very end, the referendum passed, barely, but the voter turnout was so low that the Premier stood up and said, you know what, I know we said we would go to PR if it passed, but I don't think this is a fair representation. You know, we've got huge parts of the province that were completely against it, and it didn't actually pass by much, so they actually didn't follow through with PR. We've asked um, the government now, what if that happens here in BC? And they've been very adamant, if um, people don't want PR, then they better get out and vote. The people who take the time to vote will have their voices heard. That's almost word for word what they told us. So this is, um, again, why it's important that we're talking about this, so people can make the decision. You know, one of the things, actually, I think I'll just skip over that one for a second. I'll even skip over this. Andrew Weaver, well, when he was questioned by the media, uh, Andrew Weaver basically said, I want proportional representation because it will never have a liberal majority government again if it passes. And he's actually um, probably right there because you would never actually have uh, a majority government. The odds of one party winning 50% of the vote around the entire province to form a majority would be almost impossible when you saw how many parties could run. So before I show you this one, I want to give you an example. I printed this off. This is a sample of a ballot. Remember what the first picture I showed you for a ballot for first past the post we have now? Two, three, four, or five names put on. This is what a ballot looks like in proportional representation for an election. And it's actually about this size. This is almost real life size that you would get. Hard to read from back there. But what ends up happening is you have in this case here, it's all the parties that are running in the election. The candidates that were chosen by the party uh, to you to be on the list as the MLA for that area. And you go in a box, and you'll be told to choose a party, choose a person, and have you know, different choices. And then it all goes through, and whoever ends up with, um, when it comes to the votes, it doesn't mean whoever has the majority of the votes wins. They now tally up uh, all of the uh, popular votes. And the people are appointed based on, and I know it sounds confusing, people are appointed now based on what the total popular vote around the province was. So if you look at our region, for instance, remember I showed the big picture of what the north could look like? It could. This I only say could because when we've asked, they said it might happen, they haven't confirmed. There could be in that one northern jurisdiction seven MLAs, as an example. You would no longer have a Peace River North or South where you choose me. You'd have seven MLAs in that riding. It would be up to the party of whether I am one of the people uh, to be chosen to be on uh, the seven MLAs. Then you have the election. Then the MLAs are chosen based on the proportional vote. So this is why people in favor like this. So if there's seven MLAs, you could have three appointed based on the totals. The other four based on the proportional vote. So if 10% uh, was Green, 20% was NDP, 80% was BC Liberal, you'll get one Green, two NDP, and five, or whatever the math is, four BC Liberals. So that would be the representation for that riding. You'd still, so instead of one MLA, if you're riding, you now have seven. The thought process is if you're an NDP supporter, you phone the NDP MLA and ask for help. If you're the BC Liberal supporter, you phone the BC Liberals MLA and ask for help. But that doesn't mean there's a, uh, an office in your riding. It doesn't, you know, your MLA, if you were an NDP supporter, could have been appointed in Smithers area. And that's who you'd have to phone if you were in Shetland, if that's who you wanted to talk to. So it's, you can see how it gets 
the accountability gets watered down, in, in my opinion. So, I'm sorry, I'm trying to run through this as quick as possible. It can get really confusing, but this is the ballot that's going to be coming out this fall. You're going to have a month to uh, fill this out and send it in. Another difference this time is it's a mail-in ballot. So it's the people who take the time to fill this out, mail it in. Uh, those are the votes that will be counted. And again, no regional thresholds uh, on this. So well, I just wanted to explain this because a lot of people have asked me about this. If you look at the ballot right now, it's turned into multiple choices here. Originally, it was going to be just the first question. Do you want first past the post? Or do you want to switch to PR? Um, that's what originally was said, but now they've changed it. So if you like the system that we have now, then you can fill out, you know, keep the, cur the current system, and that's all you have to fill out. And this is where it gets confusing. A lot of people are looking at this ballot thinking they have to fill out the second part as well. Because it doesn't explain that the second part is if you sign, yes, I want PR. So if you want proportional representation, if that's what's appealing to you, then you check that, and then you come down and say, okay, which one do you want? Do you want a DMP system, you know, a dual member proportional, a mixed member proportional, or a rural urban proportional? I don't know if there's anybody in this room who can explain any of those three to me. The reason being is two of them have never been used before anywhere in the world. They have just been created. Um, some academics who are pro uh, proportional representation, put these ones forward. Uh, so MMP, mixed member, that one's used around, but rural urban, nobody knew anything about this, what it is, they put it forward. So we asked, what is rural urban? And they said, well, what we'll do is we'll look at splitting up the province, and we'll have a different electoral system for the rural than the urban areas. And we might have a, and they said they'll do this after people have chosen. But rural urban, you could have a single transferable vote system um, for the rurals, and then an MMP system for urban, and that's why they're calling it a rural urban, because they'll change it depending. That's what they've explained to us, but they said they're not for sure how they'll do it until they see the results of, of the referendum. Uh, single transferable, if you don't know what that is, that's where you go in and you get to rank your ballot. Um, if you only have two people running like we did in this writing, it's going to be first past the post because it's yes or no, me or the other person. But if you have six people running in a riding, single transferable would be, this is my first choice, this is my second choice, this is my third choice, and you rank all six of them in order of who you'd like to see, and then all the votes get tallied and added together. It gets quite complicated, but it's actually an interesting system. Um, and, and mixed member is similar to what I explained earlier with the seven MLAs, and only you know, three or four you elect, and the other ones are appointed, so it's a mixed. Um, but it still comes from the list. But the main takeaway from here is, you know, if you're keeping the present system, just check the top box. Because we asked that question, what if somebody checks the top and then they also check the bottom because they think they have to? Um, the government has said, well, they'll look at what they put at the bottom because obviously um, if they don't like, or they might like first pass the post, but if <coughs> this passes, they're going to use those as a means of setting up the system. So it's, it's, going to be, uh, it's going to be quite interesting how this all plays out. And again, the main reason being is, and the main concern I have is, any questions you have, I can only answer what I know on, on this. And there's a lot we don't know. And the government has actually said that we'll wait until the referendum has happened, and we'll wait and see who um, what the province has decided um, by the people who have gone in and voted to decide how one of those systems work. To me, that's completely unfair. Um, we've asked, show us the maps. If you're going to go to um, one of those three systems, are we going to have Peace River South anymore or not? Are we going to have a large riding or not? And they said that will be decided after they see the upcoming referendum. That's been an answer on every turn. So that's why I and, and others have been quite vocal against this. If you want to give me all the information, I'll stand up here and give a balanced um, thing saying, 
this is what will happen on this side, this is what will happen on the other. It's hard when you don't have both sides of the story. And that's what's happening going into this referendum. So I'm hoping that you know there's lots of information out there online. Um, you can go to the BC Liberal website. Even listen to the people who are pro-PR and, and ask them questions. Ask me the tough questions, ask them the tough questions. And make up your mind on what you think is, is best for you. Um, to me, is our system perfect? No. But I can't see why we would be tinkering with and having uncertainty uh, in the province. To me, that uh, sends a scary message to investment um, for everything that we're trying to do in the province. If you can't create a political certain dynamic, it is hard to, to move things forward. So the federal liberals promised they were going to look at a PR system. And after they got elected uh, a couple of years back, when they looked into it, the professionals came in and showed them this is what it could mean, and how it would look in Canada. They backtracked off that promise. They said, yeah, we're breaking that promise, and they were pretty clear about it. And they, uh, they had some pushback, but I'm, I'm glad they did, because it would be pretty interesting. There's a lot of people in Canada that want to see PR, and so a lot of them are coming to BC right now and trying to help out. And so we'll, we'll have to see how this uh, plays out over the summer, or whether they fall. Please take the time to learn more. Please vote, more importantly, because we have to have a fair I understand. Question here. I would like to know who, who can vote. And so do you have to be a registered voter to vote? And how do they know? And how are, are they going to be able to scan the vote, duplicate the vote? And how are people that are not registered voters but want to vote able to register to vote in order to, to be a part of this? So, I don't know on the last part because they haven't answered that one when we've asked if people are going to be able to register like you can in an election and show that you live there now and then vote. Um, they, we haven't got the answer on that when we've asked. Uh, right now, it's anybody who's an eligible voter in BC is actually going to get the referendum. So 18 or older, and if you voted in the last election, you'll be on the list and you'll be eligible uh, to vote for this referendum. If you haven't voted? Well, even if you, sorry, even if you didn't vote. Okay. Um, if you are eligible to vote, um, you will actually get uh, the referendum to vote for, right? So, because that's a that's a good point. Because in this writing, a lot of writings, you know, you only get 40, 50 percent voter turnout, um, and so those the people who didn't vote still get to vote on the referendum. Yes. Um, this is the first presentation I've seen on the issue. Uh, what what is the Liberal Party going to be doing in the next couple of months to uh, to promote its agenda for first past the post? Sure. Well, it's probably no surprise, by the way, I'm presenting this that the BC Liberal Party, even as a whole, is is opposed to this. There's a lot of organizations um, around uh, British Columbia uh, who have come out very public against this. In fact. Uh, the anti-PR uh, association, uh, the person running it is uh, one of the former NDP, uh, John Horgan. He's actually the person who put John Horgan in government. He's actually running the anti-PR uh, because he knows as well. Uh, Ujjal Dessange, former premier, he's out uh, spoke, speaking against it. We haven't, I think, I think there hasn't been a lot of talk of it to date because people haven't been engaged because it's one of those things, not only politically, but it's, it's hard to get people talking about this until it gets closer to the time. It's no different than any provincial or municipal election. Uh, trying to talk to somebody six months before the election to say, are you gonna run in the next election? Talk to me a month before, and we'll talk then, maybe the day before the nomination ends. PR is, we're kind of seeing the same thing. The big centers, there's a lot of buzz. Uh, Vancouver Island, in Victoria, Vancouver, there's a lot of buzz because the hubs of some of the, of the groups, pro and uh, con, are, are down there really doing a lot. So we're going to be out talking a lot over the next um, month as best we can around the province saying this is our opinion, this is what we take of it, and you know, educate yourself and make up your own choice, but this is where we stand. And no different than an election campaign, you, know, you decide at the end what you want, thinks what's best for you. The struggle we're going to have is the NDP 
have already, I know I sound hyperpartisan saying this, but the NDP have taken a million dollars to use for a campaign for pro PR, but the opposition party doesn't get that. So they get it because they're in government. So we don't get uh, a million dollars to be a counter uh, side to it. So we basically are out there as a party right now, raising donations, uh, doing what getting, doing coffee shops, chamber events. Um, the NDP is spending a million dollars are going to be doing commercials on TV and other things. So it's a, they have a different, different way of being able to do it. So, so did you have a question? Yeah, Valerie, uh, I did my homework and I looked at it and I found my name on, on Janice's name on the bookers list. So they have, um, and that's one of this new pro, they do have a reference. And then I never read the next two or three pages, but there is a way to register. Uh, I was quite surprised how organized it was. Right? Well, Elections BC is, yes. is actually t handling that part. They have to, which is a good thing, because otherwise they'd really be uh, concerns. But um, not, not to scare anybody in this room, but we get a copy of the voters list, so I know everybody who voted in the last election or not. Yeah, I, I, was, yeah. <laughs> I think my question really was, like, if it's a mail-in ballot, what's yeah. stopping somebody from just photocopying it? And, and okay. it? Yeah, so that one there doesn't worry me as much. It is going to be handled by Elections BC. Um, and there have been mail-in ballots, uh, referendums, and things that have happened in the past. It is a pretty good system. Um, what they usually do is they mail it to, to everybody. Now, there's nothing stopping if you get it in your household. You know, if you have six people in your household, one person taking all six of them and filling it out saying they were the other person. I mean, there's nothing Doesn't stopping that. that. Everybody's also? Yeah. <laughs> And just have the dad or mom saying this is how you're voting. Um, <laughs> but it is it is a pretty uh, fail safe system. So it's if it's if it's going to be like the ones I've seen in the past, which I'm almost confident Elections BC will do that. It's um, like a three envelope kind of system. So you get the envelope in the mail, you open it up, you'll have the ballot. You fill out the ballot, uh, and it goes into an envelope. And that envelope will have your uh, personal information on it. And then that way, there they'll uh, be able to know cross-reference on the voters list was an actual person. That, that envelope then goes into another envelope uh, that says do not open basically until election day. And then that goes into another one that's actually mailed. And there's no return address, you don't do anything on it. So it'll get dropped in the mail, it goes down to Victoria and wherever they'll be uh, collating them all. They all sit in a box after they take them all out of the first envelope the second envelopes in and not until the actual referendum count will they take them out again cross-reference on um, the forms. So, if Actually, I think I was in, so there is a spot on the website where you can register. So I'm thinking about people who maybe weren't eligible to vote in the last election but have come of age and, and want to have their voice heard. It, it's under yeah. a BC election. Like yeah, so it'll probably. Okay, well I was just as he was fine. talking. Yeah. That's a good point. And just to clarify, I think I got those backwards. You don't, the last one with your ballot doesn't have your personal information. Your personal information is on the second one. So they actually cross you off the list, but they don't know how you voted. Then the second one, when they open it with your ballot, it's a blank envelope. I have it backwards, sorry. So do you think there's going to be an increase in MLAs if it goes to proportional representation? You kind of lead that, lean that way. Like, I, I don't know how we could. Um, well, and here's, here's the scary thought. If we keep 87 MLAs and go by the uh, popular vote, uh, you're probably not going to see the same amount of MLAs in rural British Columbia because the majority of the population lives in, in rural or, or in urban areas. Mm -hmm. Elections BC right now, um, there's well, there's a there's a bill on the floor that's protected rural seats because right now under Elections BC, what they're supposed to do is every eight years they re configure the maps and they reconfigure the ridings to try to um, make it as fair as possible around the province. So they would look at a riding like in Surrey and say, okay, well there's 95,000 people in each riding in Surrey, but there's only 40,000 in my riding and 40,000 in Dan's in the North Piece. Under the Elections BC rules, technically the whole piece should be one riding with one MLA. To be fair, if you want to put it that way, to have 90,000 people in one riding compared to 90,000 people down in Vancouver. But I joke with my uh, colleague, Sam Sullivan, who's in downtown Vancouver, 
he has 85,000, I think it was, um, constituents, but his riding is three square kilometers. Basically, you know, 12 blocks or whatever it is in downtown Vancouver. Um, we, need, we put uh, different things in place in government to protect rural ridings because of that geographic, um, those issues. I mean, if I was the MLA and it was from Prince George all the way up to Avon and the Alberta border, you need a helicopter. How do you represent people? How do you go to events? You know, if you're downtown Vancouver, you're representing 12 square blocks. And yes, it's twice as many people. Um, but I, when my colleagues from down south come up here, uh, they, they say that actually rural, rural ridings are more in touch with what's going on than urban. Uh, because we're out more and, it's, and we do stuff. And in urban centers, it's harder to do that. So how do you do it without we can go up? How do you do it with more without the more MLAs? I don't I don't know. So do you think that this is going to be a subject at UBCM? Do you think they're going to have any kind of workshops on this? I hope so. Or a panel? Uh, or a panel. And UBCM will be very as I mean and I used to be on the UBCM executive. Uh, uh, UBCM will be and should be very neutral. Uh, and just because it's turned into a bit of a political hot potato of the PC Liberals uh, against and the Greens and the NDP in favor, uh, I, I hope the UBCN puts just, uh, whether it's panel or maybe independent people, just saying, you know, this is what you get with both sides and, and yeah. let people uh, understand it. But uh, local government has a lot to gain and lose with this too. Don't kid yourselves because. You know, if you're here in Chapman and you don't know who your MLA is, I mean, right now, you know, I work with you best I can, help advocate for issues, uh, work with you at UBCM, help set up minister meetings, do whatever I can do that way. Um, if you've got two or three different MLAs representing different parties in the same jurisdiction, uh, that's going to be interesting. Um, so who do you call? What do you do? I don't know. So anyway, I hope UBCM does, and if not, I'd be very surprised. Hmm. Any questions on anything uh, other than this? Because I could talk all night about this. But you could be recording a song in the near future. That's the most important question of the night there. I'm actually in the studio right now. Yeah, we've got, uh, probably got another two, three months. We'll take it. Yeah, I've got, uh, got 11 songs on a new CD. There you go. <laughs> you, got to have a pastime too. Do you realize how important that could be for this issue, though? You could sing about it. <laughs> I'll no, do a jingle. Actually, actually, it might have to be his, uh, his fallback if he talks. <laughs> <laughs> if this goes through your sale? Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, and in all fairness, I watch all the comments, kind of too bad. I watch all the comments on social media, and uh, you know, some people are saying, oh, well, we're out there advocating in geese because we're worried about losing our jobs. For all I know, I could stay as an MLA and I'd be in a different jurisdiction. I have no idea what's going to happen. So it's. It's not about that uh, at all. I mean, I had a good job before I had this one, so <laughs> I'll go back to Mayor Dawson. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> kidding, probably won't let me. Um, but, but I think what's important is you're going to see a lot of stuff, especially on social media, the fringe stuff on all sides. Water all that down. The truth's probably in the middle on everybody's uh, comments. And again, the, the, most important thing is I hope people get engaged and just ask questions on this because my the biggest fear for me not only for this riding but for the province is people are just not going to know what's at stake whether you, whether whichever side you're on and they're going to be asleep at the wheel when the referendum happens um, because to the point there hasn't been really a lot of buzz about it um, there's been a lot of questions and a little talk but it hasn't really been given the attention that I think a lot of people need to make an informed decision and to understand what's what they're voting on or what changed. Because I don't want people to uh, wake up the day after the referendum and say, oh, I can't believe that's what happened and I was totally, but I didn't vote. So speaking of buzz, can you do an, uh, an update on the marijuana legislation? Yeah, so that one's a little bit more complicated because there isn't any provision. And the reason being is, in, in all fairness to the government, uh, it's the federal government is, has made the announcement that it's going to be legalized, not decriminalized, legalized, uh, 
on the bats uh, in all of Canada. But each jurisdiction, each province now has to look at what is this going to mean? What are we going to do for um, distracted driving laws? We're going to have to change those because right now the distracted driving laws say for alcohol. It doesn't say anything about marijuana consumption. There's a lot of uh, misinformation out there about people saying, well, well that's crazy. Now I have no smoke a joint and go to work. Well, no, you can't. You're still impaired. And so we have to have WCB regulations change now because you, know, you have to you know, unsafe workplaces with alcohol. Where does marijuana come in now that it's, right now it just says you can't do it because it's illegal. Well, now that it's legalized, how are we going to manage that? And there's going to be a lot of things that municipalities and regional districts still have to figure out, and they're waiting for the rules from the provincial government around um, growing and selling. Where can that take place? You know, districts are going to have to decide what do you, what's going to happen for dispensaries, uh, what's going to happen for maybe ALR land to be used for, I'll still call it a grow up. Um, so in all fairness to the government, there was a lot of um, hints in the spring session that legislation was coming, but they couldn't actually put it on the floor until they knew exactly what the federal government was uh, going to follow through with and looking for advice there. So we go to session, well, I haven't officially been called. The assumption is we're going to session beginning of October, October, November, mostly to deal with marijuana legislation. That's, that's the assumption because we have to. And so the government has to put it on the floor um, for debate. Which my tongue in cheek on is I wish we had this on the floor for debate, but we didn't. It was just something. So. But uh, no, that's a good question because from a from a chamber perspective too, for business, there's going to be decisions local governments can have to make. Where, possibly, where are, are we going to allow um, the sale of this? So some municipalities are already out there saying, you know, has to be a certain distance away from schools. You can't be smell, smoking marijuana uh, uh, in public places, but you can vape in public places, or you can eat. A good, I'm learning more than I thought I'd ever know. My colleague in Nelson Creek, Kathleen Connolly, is hosting a workshop, a one-day workshop on um, cannabis in the workplace. It's coming up in the next few weeks. If you log on to their Facebook page, you can um, register to attend that. And in November, um, I'm going to be doing a series of workshops, um, probably three or four, called It's Legal, Now What? Because people are going to miss that, that opportunity. So we're going to be doing with the Chamber a series of workshops, probably October, November. Um, that people can sign up for to kind of get updated on the new legislation rules yeah. information. There is a good chance what we're hearing is that the sale and distribution will be through government liquor stores. That so, was the last we heard as well. And so if that happens, there's a lot of push um, because right now, and not, I don't know anyone here, but we, you know, for instance, there's a medicinal dispensary in the Dawson Creek Mall. If you go into large urban centers, I know in Victoria when I walk around, uh, back to my apartment and we're in session. I don't think I can go more than six, seven businesses without seeing another dispensary. And so if there's a lot of pushback from them because they're saying if it all goes to the liquor stores, what happens to all these independent businesses out there now they're trying to set up? So this is where uh, the NDP will find out being in government is a lot harder than they think because now you have to make decisions. <laughs> um, was there any other specific questions? Because I know I talked a lot on this, but I um, really want to thank you too, because I think um, it's really important. I know we're going into uh, a municipal election here. There's some people that won't be running again. Uh, some haven't announced one way or the other. So I want to thank you for what you've done and for the relationship we've had. Um, local government, you know, I've got a real soft spot for it. That's uh, where I started. And to me, it's an amazing uh, part of government because you actually you can make effective, fairly immediate in comparison, uh, change and help your, your community. So um, my hat always goes off to anybody who puts their name forward for local governments. Um, I know the election is coming up soon, so thanks for those of you who are involved right now in the room, and, and thanks if you're not running again for everything you've done, and best of luck to those of you who are deciding to run again. And we'll see you on the other side of the first past the post finish line. Ha, 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 ha.